Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And I just want to say happy Memorial Day to all our viewers out there. Happy Memorial Day. This is the day when, at least here in America, we set aside to honor all of those who have given their ultimate sacrifice in service to their country. We remember our fallen soldiers who bravely gave their lives to fight for our freedom and pre preserve the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all of us. Different countries celebrate differently, and it may even be called by a different name, but the result is the same. We all remember the fathers, we remember the husbands, the sons, the brothers, the close friends who died fighting for freedom. The cost of freedom is never cheap, but often overlooked. Most times it costs our all and is most often paid with blood. I remember growing up as a young boy in the Cayman Islands, a British dependency territory. We celebrated Poppy Day. Thousands of red poppies would be sold and everyone would be wearing at least one poppy. There would be parades and as a Cub Scout, I would be a part of that parade, proudly wearing my Cub Scout uniform. But the fullness of what we were celebrating did not fully sink in. I did not fully understand what we were actually celebrating. I suppose it's the same way, like the freedom that we enjoy in Christ, who endured death on the cross to pay the ultimate price for our freedom. And a lot of the times, we don't fully comprehend the ultimate price that Jesus paid for our freedom. All down through the years, men, women, and children have paid a high price to preserve the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet, that right is slowly ebbing away. Esther was one of those who theoretically put her own life in harm's way to preserve the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for her people. I want you to turn with me, please, to our chapter or our scripture reading, which is found in Esther chapter 4, verse 6 through 11. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that, that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So what's going on here? What's happening? Well, there is a Jew called Mordecai and an Agite called Haman, and Mordecai's niece named Esther. Now, the king of Persia, Azurerus, had promoted Haman, the one that the Bible calls the enemy of the Jews. Look at Esther chapter three, verse one and two. After these things, King Ahas ha Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the king's officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. 
But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. So this Jew, Mordecai, would not bow down and pay homage to Haman like the king had so commanded. Let me just say that not every command, not every law that comes out of government is to be followed or obeyed by Christians. I want you to listen to this excerpt from the book, Tortured for Christ, a first-hand account of Richard Warmbrand's experiences and sufferings under communism. I quote, Unfortunately, when the communists came to power, thousands of priests, pastors, and ministers did not know how to discern between the two voices. Now these two voices that, that, that Richard Warmbrand is talking about here are one, the voice of love, and two, the voice of seduction. And he's saying that they could not discern between the voice of seduction and the voice of love. And the same thing is true today. The voice of seduction is ringing so loudly that it's drowning out the voice of love. And we cannot discern between the voice of, the, uh, of seduction and the voice of love. If they're saying, oh, it's for your own good. It's all in your best interest. When the truth is, it is not in your best interest. And it's, it's going to hurt you the most. And you won't realize it until the noose is already around your neck and it's being pulled tight. Then you will, re will realize what is actually happening. But let us continue with the quote from Tortured for Christ. I continue reading. The communists convened a congress of all Christian bodies in a parliament building. There are 4,000 priests pastors and ministers of all denominations. And these men of God chose Joseph Stalin as honorary president of this Congress. At the same time, he was president of the world movement of the godless and a mass murderer of Christians. One after another, bishops and pastors arose and declared that communism and Christianity are fundamentally the same and could coexist. One pastor after another said words of praise towards communism and assured the new government of the loyalty of the church. Then I, I love this part because Sabrina, so Sabina, his wife, was like, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. I'm sure some of you remember that from, from the Popeye the Sailor Man cartoon. Because she's listening to all of these people, and she, she heard all that she could take, and she just could not take anymore. Listen to this. I read, my wife and I were present at this Congress. Sabina told me, Richard, stand up and wash away this shame from the face of Christ. They're spitting in his face. And I said to her, if I do so, you lose your husband. She replied, I do not wish to have a coward as a husband. Then I arose and spoke to the Congress, praising not the murderers of Christians, but Christ Jesus, stating that our loyalty is due first to him. The speeches at this Congress were broadcast and the whole country could hear proclaim from the rostrum of the communist parliament the message of Christ. Afterwards, I had to pay for this, but it was worth it. And let me just finish up this quote by reading this. Orthodox Protestant church leaders competed with each other in yielding to communism. An orthodox bishop put the hammer and sickle on his robes and asked his priest to no longer call him your grace, but comrade bishop. I attended a congress of the Baptists in the town of Reseda, a congress under the red flag, where the anthem of the Soviet Union had been sung with everyone standing. The president of the Baptists, praised Stalin as a great teacher of the Bible and proclaimed that Stalin did nothing but fulfill the commandments of God. End of quote. 
Richard Warmbrand said that that one of the Lutheran bishops began to teach in their, their theological seminary that God had given three revelations. One through Moses, another through Jesus, and a third through Stalin. The last superseded the one before, if you can even begin to believe that. These are Christian men, Christian professors who are teaching this in their theological seminaries. But I ask you, isn't that exactly what we're doing today? They're claiming that Jesus would support transgenderism and, and the scriptures condone abortions. But scripture never contradict itself. Some Christians believe that we're to obey every government law and party ideals for the sake of unity, even if it violates the laws of God. This is not so. This is not to be. As one brand said, we are loyal first and foremost to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There is nothing in all creation that can trump the law of God. Whenever the laws of God or the laws of man contradict the laws of God, that is the moment we part ways. We say adios, bye-bye, hasta la vista. Do not let the media brainwash you into believing something else, or do not let them teach you something new, something different than what was taught to you in the beginning. Acts chapter four, verse 15 through 20 says, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you judge. For we cannot speak of what we have heard and seen. Peter and John said, you, you think about it. Is it right to obey you just because you're earthly rulers over God, our heavenly father? You must judge. Matter of fact, we can't even be silent because we cannot help but speak because this news is so exceedingly great. It's so exceedingly wonderful. We cannot be quiet. We cannot be silent. We cannot be shut up because it's just too great. We got to share it. If only the church was like that today. But instead, the church today let party loyalty steer them in voting in evil. And fear intimidates them in being quiet. But know this. What you, what you vote for is what you support. And what you support is what you will be judged on. So, choose wisely. Choose prayerfully. Government is bent on murdering babies. They're bent on sacrificing babies in the sanctity of their mother's womb. And they call it a woman's choice. And some Christians have bought into the life for which they will have to give an account to God for the life that they have taken. In today's world, at least here in America, the national average gas price is $4.48 and it's almost $6 in some places according to the reports. We spend 70 to $75 every four days on gas. There are warnings of food shortages and even famines while food processing plants are mysteriously exploding and burning to the ground. What's that all about? 
Apparently, there's rumors that wheat will be no longer exported. Baby food and baby formula are in scarcity, while Bill Gates is introduced in a synthetic milk. What's that about? Viruses are being released almost yearly for which they have pharmaceutical solutions and no one challenges, no one even questions it. It's just a part of life. We've come to accept it. The nations are giving up their sovereign right to make their own decisions and handing that right over to an entity that suppresses real treatment in favor of the big P. And I gotta say the big P, because if we say the word, our message will be taken down and we'll be put in time out like they did us before. It is a fact that they are proposing to put nanotechnology in treatments that will relate messages to the insurance companies. Among such messages will be whether or not you have taken your medicine. I understand that cell phones will be a thing of the past. They will, they will no longer be a need for cell phones because they will be embedded in the human body. While the plans of subjugation are being laid and confirmed, America is distracted by celebrity divorce. It's plastered all over the TV. We have become a nation that loves our ears tickled and we are easily distracted. Hard times are coming, but no one seems to care or be even concerned about it. They keep voting the same way for the same people without holding anyone accountable or responsible. And not just that, but by giving up our national sovereignty so easily, we have now blackened, even blotted out the memory of what our men and our women of the armed forces have fought so bravely and who have died for to give us. We just spit upon it. Remember, this is Memorial Day weekend. This is tomorrow. We'll be celebrate Memorial Day, the day that we remember our fallen soldiers. You know, several years ago, a man came into my office and when he was leaving, I said, Merry Christmas, to which he, he responded, that's not politically correct. I couldn't believe my ears. I thought to myself, I didn't, I didn't say it to him, but I could have said it to him. Uh, I was like, what? Excuse me? Have you ever spent one day in our armed forces? Well, I spent four years, I gave up four years of my life to serve in the U.S. Army to ensure that me and my children and my children's children and their children could say Merry Christmas. Now you're telling me that it's politically incorrect? But someone would say, oh, but it may offend someone. Well, it offends me that you, can, you tell me that I can't say Merry Christmas when I serve for the right to say Merry Christmas. Now it's offensive to you. So l let me just understand this fully so there, there's nothing that, that's kind of gray out there. I want to understand this. I can't say Merry Christmas in free America because it might offend someone who hates America and who have never served America. But those who have served are to be silent because it might offend the haters of America? Well, that makes a lot of sense. Not. Nah. Makes absolutely no sense. Look at what Mordecai and the other Jews did as soon as they heard the news. Esther chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. When Mar Mordecai learned that that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, 
there was great mourning among the Jews with fasted and weeping and lamented and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. As soon as Mordecai and the Jews heard the news, they began to fast, they began to weep, they began to cry out. They cried out to the Lord their God for help. But the church today won't even pray, much less fast. Matter of fact, they will ridicule a message like this. Instead of getting down on their knees and crying out for help from our Heavenly Father. The church is too busy chasing the secular when we should be busy about the Father's business. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the establishment is not for you. Tribulation is coming. Times of hardship like no never ever before is on its way. All the good and all the prosperity that we once knew will be taken away. Those who believe that they will be spared because they did nothing or they voted for it or they joined in to help speed this along will be in for a great but disappointing surprise. I'm telling you now, you won't be spared either just because you voted that way. Esther was afraid. She did not want to go into the king to ask for help. So let me just back up just a little bit. Let me put this a little closer into perspective. See, this Haman hated the Jewish people. And when he was promoted, the king ordered that everyone bow down to him. And everyone did, except for Mordecai. So Haman despised not only Mordecai, but the whole Jewish nation. And he planned to kill them all. He got government to decree laws making it legal and they would allow the murder of millions or hundreds, at least hundreds of thousands of Jews. Does that sound familiar today? And not necessarily Jews, but people in general, Christians in specific. If it doesn't, it soon will. So the king made the decree that the time was that th that this was to happen and the time was set when mordecai heard the news he sent this message message to his niece esther via Pathak, her eunuch esther chapter 4 verse 8 mordecai also gave them a copy of the written decree issued in susa for their destruction and that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Notice that Mordecai did not ask her or plead with her. He commanded her. In other words, he's saying, Esther, this is a serious thing. This is very, very serious. There's no time to be playing around here. There's no time to be acting so queenie. I'm telling you, no, I'm commanding you, go to the king and beg for favor. Beg for your people. But Esther was like the church. We can't witness because it's not politically correct. Besides, they may make fun of us. Look at Esther chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Then Esther spoke to Hathat and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. As for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. That did not impress or faze Mordecai in any way whatsoever. Something had to be done, and the logical choice, the only choice, was Esther. She was the one to do the job. So he sent this, this message back to Esther. Esther chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silent at this time, relief 
and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai told Queen Esther that if she kept silent, God will raise up relief for his people, for the Jews someplace else, but she and her father's house will perish. Here's the kicker though. Mordecai told, told Esther, who knows? Maybe you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm here to remind you today. Remember the individual you felt compelled to witness though, but chickened out? Who knows, maybe you were in such a position at such a time for that person. Maybe you were their last hope. Did you witness? The times are hard. Jesus is on his way back. We don't have a whole lot of time left to be fooling around. We don't have a whole lot of time left to do what we have been called to do. So what am I to do then, Brother Kenny? Well, look at what Mordecai did. Verse 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Mordecai did not say, I can't believe that. I refuse to believe that government would do that to us. It's a lie. I won't believe it. No. Mordecai did not shoot the messenger just because he did not like the message. Instead, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and cried out to his God. And what do you suppose would happen if the church tore their clothes and put on sackcloth and cried out with a loud and bitter cry to the Lord our God? What do you think would happen? Revival would break out. That is what will happen. The hand of God would begin to move again like times of old and a great deliverance would come. But celebrity fascination is just too strong. It's just too overwhelming. Christians are too programmed by the TV. They're caught up with royalty. They're caught up with celebrity. They're caught up with the rich and famous. It's not the news. It's a distraction. It's distracting you from what you should be doing. You know, Derek Prince said that you want to see a move of God in your life? Switch two things. Switch the amount of time that you spend watching TV with the amount of time you spend reading your Bible. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So spend the amount of time that you're now watching, that, that, that you spend watching TV or on your social media or whatever you do on your, on your cell phone. Spend that time in prayer and reading your Bible and see the difference. Remember, you're a soldier in the army of the Lord. No soldier in active service does whatever he or she wants whenever he or she wants. They're disciplined to serve and they're disciplined to obey orders. Now is the time for us Christians to be disciplined. Now is the time to be obedient to our commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the commander of the Lord's army. He's the commander in chief of the Lord's army. Now is the time to join up if you haven't already. What better time to honor our fallen troops but to take up the fight for freedom this Memorial Day. So as usual, my question is, are you a soldier in the army of the Lord? If not, would you like to be a soldier in the army of the Lord? Would you like to fight for freedom? Would you like to have freedom yourself? Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. All you have to do is to say this prayer with me. 
And if you want to experience that freedom, repeat this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for forgiving me, for paying the price on Calvary when you hung on the cross. Thank you that you died that I might have life. I accept your free gift of life. I accept your free gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want for you to do is that, again, buy a Bible, read your Bible, spend more time reading your Bible and praying than you do watching your TV or on your cell phone, on your social media. Join a church, a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches, but a Bible-believing churches who believe that there's a right way and a wrong way. And here's the right way, walk ye in it. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And as usual, we thank you so much for joining us each and every week. We want to say happy Memorial Day from our family to your family. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.